Thanks, Mike. So, hi, everyone. Uh, so, I guess uh, that was a very short intro. So, I'll just add a, a few things, a few things. So, my name is Nan. I work for VMware. Well, I work for a division that's the VMware Hybrid Cloud Services. We heavily use Puppet. And today's talk, I'm going to dive into how we use Puppet and the things that makes our services go. And uh, it's going to go a little bit deep. So, uh, for those of you who were here in the last talk, the guy says, I, we don't do crazy stuff with Puppet, and I'm kind of the opposite guy. I'm the guy who's like, Puppet internals, here I come. I want to take it apart, do some fun stuff with it. So you get to hear some of the internals that we take apart uh, and what the stuff we do with Puppet. So uh, I'll get in a little bit into what VMware, hybrid, uh, VMware vCloud hybrid service. Uh, uh, it's not so much of telling you what it is. First of all, who here uses VMware? I just want to get a raise of hand. Great, I have a room full of experts, because I am not the VMware experts, and I know I see a roll of people from VMware there that knows far more about VMware, and if you have a question about VMware and how their uh, internals work, ask those guys. I'm not it. I'm going to focus on how we empower the service and let you guys who understand the APIs take advantage of it. So that's what I'm going to focus on, talking about automation with Puppet. So I'm going to talk about what we do and how we automate it. And we'll talk a little bit about the things that we learned, uh, the lessons I've learned trying to automate the VMware infrastructure. So I don't know if you guys are trying to automate your internal infrastructure. If you have VMware infrastructure, uh, maybe some of the things I talk here will be applicable for your environment. So hopefully that's a takeaway for you. All right, so uh, a little bit about uh, vCloud hybrid services. So first of all, what exactly is this service? Uh, today, those of you who raise your hands, you have VMware somewhere in your environment. And this consists of ESX, vSphere, vCD. I don't know how far you guys go. So I don't know how far up the stack. I, I guess you can start simple, just do ESX, and you can go all the way up the entire suite of things. So what vCloud hybrid services does is allow you to have somewhere where you can easily port your application to our hosted environment, uh, let you run your existing apps, it's seamless, allows you to transition over, and we provide the service. So I'm part of the team that works on VMware vCloud hybrid services, and we have to stand this up for our customers. So if you're one of our customers, this is your view. This is how you see our infrastructure, because when you log in, you're not dealing with the nitty gritty. You see our, our fancy product for short says, you log into a web console, you have access to vCloud API, and at this point, you have application catalog fired up, run VMs, everything goes, and you have access to VMware's compute, storage, and our network and security. So at this point, uh, all the stuff that you're expected is up and running, because what's painful when you do it yourself you have to run these services. You have to set them up. You have to connect them. You have to get them going. And all these things, you don't have to deal with. So this is a fancy, nice, really neat customer view. Because you come in, things are ready, you get in, and start, start to use it. Now here's me. I walk in. I am the engineer here. And I go, like, how do I enable the customers to do this? Well, I don't just go walk in and say, here's an API. You can go use it. I walk in and go, like, Here's my dependency. We did an internal diagram. I know this is impossible to read. I'm not intending to have anyone be able to read this slide. And the goal here is to show you it's a complicated environment. To get this thing set up, we have lots of dependencies. There's lots of stuff to get done. I'm going to get the things wrong, but I'll just mention a couple of things. So first off, you have to get your ESX up and ready. You get your ESX up, then you get your vCenter, you get your vCenter appliance, you attach your ESX to vCenter, you get vShield running, you attach vShield to vCenter, then you get vCD running, and then you get import this vCenter and ESX, and you get all this stuff in there. And finally, at this point, out of all these steps, if you didn't make a mistake, everything was perfect, you didn't miss enter an IP address, you didn't miss enter a network, maybe you have a logging console. If something's gone wrong, there's lots of things here that could go wrong. So this is the come, kind of, we'll talk about a little bit about why we're getting into and using Puppet. So this was my first day on the job. I walked in the job and people says, we're running this fantastic service. You need to learn how to automate it. And I got handed this thing. And trust me, this is not the entirety. This is not the entirety, and this is one of the best, I'm not going to ding the guys who wrote this, because this is one of the best documentation I've gotten to. Because I went to work, I, I walked into places where you had no idea where the network is, what IP address is. This is a fantastic doc, but when the guy handed it to me, he says, oh, by the way, it's out of date. And you're going to run into problems that's wrong, that's going to be failed, and that's incorrect. And this is actually, like I said, when I first sat down and tried this, I was like, it's actually pretty good, but it's a document. And people were like, Oh, that's fantastic. That's better than what I had. What's your problem with this document? I call it the click fail. 
Because I go in the document, and I'm going to just extract one of the pages here. And one of the pages says, and here's me. You guys are all VMware experts. I'm not. I walked in there on day one and says, you need to click these things. I had no idea where it is in the UI. I kept having to ask someone as my coworkers, like, show me where this little clicky thing is, because I don't know where this clicky thing is. And it says, continue on this to the vSphere client. I'm going to like read this, because you guys are experts, and you're going to laugh that I can't click find these things and click them. And inside the console, click on the VPC. Enter the host name, click on the location, click next. Oh my gosh. I did a search on click, and I was like, click fail. My happiness at my job is inversely correlated to the number of clicks I do. <laughs> so the more clicks I do, you can ask the guys there. If I had to go to GitHub and click on a merge request, I get upset. I said, where's a gem so I can type this on the command line so I don't have to click? So I don't have to click on what branch it is, what repo it is, where it comes in. I don't want to do any of that. So when I saw this document, I looked at the number of clicks. I was sad. So here's what my challenge was. Here I got in. This is an awesome infrastructure. People love using VMware Stack, and they want to be able to just get in and use it. I want to just be able to deploy it. I'm used to doing Puppet stuff. I'm an ex-Puppet Labber, so I, I go through all the stuff, and I'm used to just doing Puppet Agent T. That, um, any of you guys use Puppet here? I'm assuming this is a Puppet account, right? So everyone knows what Puppet Agent T is, right? Puppet Agent T. I want to do the same thing for my VMware services. I want to do Puppet Agent T and CVMware services immediately. So I want to re reduce the deployment time. I want to reduce the complexity. I have that giant doc. I I'm like, next guy who gets it from me, I don't want to give him this doc. I want to give him a much simpler way of getting VCD up. So I also want to scale fast. So at this point, like, everyone's excited. We had lots of people who heard about this, and they're like, hybrid services. Oh, I don't have to deal with this? Let's go back a few slides. I don't have to deal with this internally. I'm signing on. So and people are like, how do I get on? And we go like, wait, we have to deal with it now. So we have to make it simple for ourselves. So our solution is automate. And there's, there's the second rule. See the first rule. There's nothing else to do. For, for me, it's like, if, if you come to me and says, this is a problem, we well, say, automate it. So again, to simplify things a little bit, here's the three things I had to deal with initially. So vCenter is the attachment of VMware Network and Security, which is vShield plus vSphere. So these are the two things that need to connect. And once they're installed, I can install vCloud. So I'm going to talk a little bit of how I get to vCloud in terms of our infrastructure. So uh, we had some dependent services. I'm not going to talk about them. When we had to puppetize them. There's awesome modules. It's on Forge. It's on GitHub. People have already wrote things for NTP syslog. These are fairly straightforward. If everyone, funny enough, like NTP is actually, people don't seem to get it right, but that's a different story for another time. But once these basic dependent services on, I have to deal with the next challenge. And these are things, that's things that people haven't dealt with. There isn't a module somewhere when I started to say, we're going to do vCenter, vShield, and vCD. And it's like, you, I have to puppetize it. So when I looked at these things, why are they a little bit different? They're not a traditional OS. When you're talking about manipulating something in vCenter, you're dealing from an API. So there's a vSphere API. Uh, any of you guys, you guys use like the Perl, PowerShell? OK, so, some PowerShell guys. Um, I think there might be a Python API. Anyone using that? RBV Mommy? Anyone using RBV Mommy? OK, you guys could be my best friends, because you're using RBV Mommy, and I also use RBV Mommy. We'll, we'll get into that in a little bit later. So vCNS, vShield. How many of you have vShield in your environment? Uh, uh, do you guys uh, use a vShield API? How many of you use a vShield API? Does any of you enjoy the clicking, setting vShield rules? Someone, someone, someone raise their hand that they enjoy clicking on vShield setting. Oh, you're the exception. Maybe my talk doesn't apply to you, so uh, I can't help you here. But if you enjoy clicking, I can't help your problem, because I don't, I don't share your same problem. This. The VCD also has the REST API. So none of these things run an operating system. It's not run on top of OS. I can't just go package insure. I can't just go here deploy a file and here restart a service. And all these traditional puppet patterns just didn't work for me. So these are, these are things I need to fix. And on top of that, vCenter and vCNS are appliances. So a lot of times we go like, my gosh, I want a puppet agent on that thing. But they're appliances, and I can't just go directly into those things and apply them. So even though I work for VMware, I'm not special. So I, I don't get to just bam install Puppet and, and work with them. So how do I actually solve these challenges? First of all, 
I've done some work with Puppet devices, and Puppet devices is supposed to talk to things that are uh, remote. So network things, so uh, Cisco switches, F5 network devices, these are some things that we've tried to automate, and we use the command Puppet devices. In Puppet device, you get a sir, you talk to some API, you talk to some remote services, and it works pretty well. But for me, I couldn't use Puppet device. Puppet device was intended to talk to a single thing. It has a single thing view of the world. Its kind of idea is, well, like an agent, you're a single host, so you have a single device. But in vShield, I sometimes have to talk to two things simultaneously. I have to talk to vShield and talk to vCenter simultaneously, so I go like, this is not gonna work for me. So, since it's not gonna work for me, let's scratch. What works, what's fantastic in Puppet? It's resource model. It's types and providers. That, that works fantastic. So I thought like, I can model the whole world. It's remote, but I can still treat it like a resource. Resources behavior are item potent. I can describe what my desire state is. I can apply it, and if it didn't apply correctly or something went wrong, I need a manual fix. I can come back and apply it again, and it wouldn't modify anything. Those are all fantastic behaviors. And like, even though I'm dealing with an API, I don't really want to write scripts. I don't want to go from writing bash OS scripts to writing PowerShell, which I knew nothing about, against vSphere to automate my job. So I was like, I want to take the great behaviors that I know now that I do inside an offering system and apply it to the APIs and endpoints that I deal with. So that's, that's what I decided to do. And uh, the one thing that I had to create to allow me to do this is something called transport. So transport is a resource, and what, it wa what I wanted to do is give me the capability to do things that I don't have. And this became the hammer to all the, tool, all the problems I have because transport provided SSH and SSH connectivity to the appliances. I connected to them via SSH. I can tell them to issue a command locally. I can look at the output. I can decide whether it's good or bad. And then I can run whatever else I need on the appliance themselves. So they're closed, but you know, I have authentication. I know what its IP is. I can get in. Sure, done. Uh, vCenter, RBV Mommy. So for those of you who raise your hand, RBV Mommy, VMware open source project. So someone wrote it in Ruby Gem and says, wouldn't it be nice if uh, all those people who love Ruby can directly interface with vSphere API? And I go like, well, done. Someone already wrote, a, wrote something in Ruby, so I'll take advantage of that. So the vShield and vCD stuff is something that's a little bit new. Uh, there's no one who wrote a gem for it. Uh, it's all REST API, but uh, for vShield, uh, we stole a little bit of the Savant project, so we use Gilku mainly to do some XML transformation because all the data has to be transformed to XML at the end. So we did that for vShield and vCD. So in this case, what does the transport do for you? The transport resource does three things. It provides credentials. So you have to say, how do I connect to a particular thing? Like, well, what are the credentials for it? So username, password. Connectivity options. Um, I need to silence my phone, apparently. Sorry, guys. <laughs> connectivity options. So uh, what are things you want to pass in as connectivity? So like, for example, vSphere, Rev 5051, what are the re revisions of it? And the other thing is I want to deal with multiple connections. So I don't want to specify one transport, and I'm limited by that one transport. Like I said earlier, I want to be able to connect to multiple things in the same catalog run. So the next thing here is if we look, we see this is an example of a transport resource. And I show you examples of two of them. First of all, the, up here, this is VCSA, for this is our vCenter appliance, this is using SSH. So the one on top, that's a username and password via SSH. You give the server DNS or IP address. And down here, you can give it any SSH options. So user known host files, sometimes we redeploy the VM. And when we redeploy the VM, we're gonna put in dev null because we don't really wanna store the keys there. So uh, in the transfer for vCenter, this is using RBV mommy. Again, give me the username, password, tell me what server it is. It happens to be the same host but I'm using two different kind of connectivity. First, I'm gonna do SSH to it, then I'm gonna use vSphere API against it, and down here I'm gonna say, hey, by the way, I don't really know what the SSL key is gonna be in advance, and I don't know what, I know the revision is gonna be 5.1, so use specifically the 5.1 APIs uh, in RBV Mommy to talk to it. So this is the transport, and that's what it looks like. And that describes this picture here. So the puppet, first, you have a transport via SSH to talk to the appliance. Second, you use a vSphere API, and inside vSphere API you can do manipulations such as add ESX, create folders, do all the things, et cetera, in there. So um, I have an appliance, and uh, I'm sure for those of you who've uh, uh, done uh, vSphere stuff, this is all your welcome screen, right? Get on this, log in, click on a sub EULA, set this up, uh, do all these things. And I go like, I'm not a clicking guy, right? I, I, I kind of said that in the beginning. 
So I'm going to run. I'm just going to run this thing. I'm going to apply it. I'm going to tell it to go ahead and set this appliance up. It's using the SSH connectivity. It's going to take, I think, five to 10 minutes. So rather than make you watch this, I'm going to go on. I'm going to go on. I'm going to come back, and we'll see whether this did the job. And apparently, I've already failed. So let's see. We'll do some, oh, I need to change the IP address. Sorry. So it's all, always the, the demo part, right? So I'm pretty sure the server is 184. I was uh, incrementing and testing this out, so I'm applying against the ROM system. Let, let, let me just make sure this goes a little bit further along than just I can't connect to the remote system. There you go. It's uh, accepting the EULA down there. So it's, it's moving along. I'm going to come back to it in a bit. So again, this, if uh, all things go right and I get, don't get jinxed by the demogons, we should see that login screen at the, uh, at the end of this. So. While I let that run, we'll continue on a little bit. So uh, again, once you talk to vCenter, I don't want to do the clicking. So we use a vCenter API. Again, it looks like Puppet. We can describe a, a ESX host. We can get it attached. We can tell it what time to run, what NTP server it is, what the actual uh, interactive shell login is. Do you want SSH enabled? Because you know something goes wrong. I always want to have SSH, et cetera. And here, if you look at the bottom, it's using Transport vCenter. So now I'm using the vSphere API to continue the setup once everything is done. So again, just looks like a normal public resource. You can apply it. Uh, and when this is all done, when I finally get VCD up, again, VCD resource, I can tell what the Vim server is. I can tell what VShow manager it is. I can say what PVDC I want to deploy. I want to say what storage profile, et cetera. And this is getting further and further away from things I'm familiar with. But you know, I'm working with an API. The person who knows exactly what things he wants inside vCenter describes these things. We apply it. And then when the system comes online, it gets rolling and apply the correct things to it. So the transport, uh, what it does is gives us a persistent shared connection. So it reuses the same connection over and over. Uh, it does connection cleanup. This was one of the things that baffled me for a long time because uh, we had too many SSH connections to appliance and I was realizing I just kept opening connection and didn't close them. So after a while, I figured out what the problem was. We actually patch transport. So transport uh, at the end of the run, it will say, I'll do a nice thing for you. I'm done. I'm going to close my SSH connection down. Or vSphere, I'm going to close my SS vSphere connection down. So I'll do that. And one of the things you guys noticed, does all your puppet run always succeed? No. OK, so, so this is also, it's a little bit of a monkey patch. I won't say it's pretty, but it's also done in a way so it doesn't matter if your resource fails. Because uh, in the beginning, I had this problem where I go, like, why don't I just make it a resource? I'll depend on other resources, and I'll do the closing of connection at the end. Didn't work very well for me. Because if something failed during the apply, I didn't want the SSH connection open. So this is one of the challenges there where I'm kind of like getting a little bit too far from Puppet's internal. But this is one of the things we had to do. And also, it's, this is open to support other things. So internally, we use the RabbitMQ, which is used REST. And some guy found the way I do this kind of neat. So he says, I'm going to just borrow the same idea. So this transport is something that can be borrowed. So the next thing I want to uh, tell you guys is the fantastic part about open source is we have this on GitHub. And I don't know if a lot of people know VMware actually has a GitHub account. So on the GitHub account, we have these modules. And these things are uh, available. You're welcome to take it and play with it. This is how we deploy internally. And as we work through issues, we update them. So uh, a few quick things is the current main branch is for Puppet 2.7. And the development branch is working with Puppet 3. So we, we had people. I want to thank the community. There's some guy who out there who was ahead of us. He tried it on Puppet 3 and said, by the way, you have this problem. And when I saw that bug, I was like, hmm. Well, we're doing the upgrade soon, and thanks for the bug report. And his bug was extremely helpful when we were upgrading to 3.2. So if you guys want to try it out, contribute back, fork it, just ping us. Uh, I might not respond instantly, but like I said, we're using this, so we have a shared interest to keep and maintain this. So let's see if uh, I'm lucky enough that this thing has finished. Hasn't quite yet, so uh, I do want to show some of the connectivity stuff. So I'm going to give this a second while it applies. So I want to give people a chance. Does anyone have any questions in the meantime? Could you step up to the mic? Sorry, sorry to make you do this halfway through the demo, and I'm going to make you do it again at the end. Uh, the question is, is could you comment a little more about you're saying that rather than managing a single node, it looks like you're managing a set of potential nodes, each with IP address, and whether you automated any of the address management 
Um, and also it looks like you don't have to use things to coordinate across nodes such as PuppetDB or stored configs. Yeah. So today, uh, we don't use something that does cross-node coordination. There's a reason I'm wearing this particular t-shirt. So Nick out there, who's doing the presentation tomorrow about Project Zombie, will explain a little bit more about how we orchestrate, orchestrate stuff. So here, I'm strictly talking about making things happen to a particular vCenter. And also, we have a resource lib calculation that does the calculation stuff. Later on, I'll talk a little bit about the challenges we had with ENCs. We use ENC as a source of data. So something computes, figures out how the layout is. We have you know, a map of our network. We know how it looks, and it's pre-calculated. It comes in through an ENC, and it gets applied. So, so this doesn't deal with the orchestration part, and doesn't deal with that. So since this is done, you guys can see that all the steps have been applied. And hopefully, now, uh, if this is the right IP, I have a warning. Sure, I have a warning with my security. And uh, like I said, uh, if all goes well, um, we have a login. So again, didn't, didn't click on any agreeable stuff, didn't do any of this. Uh, we should have a happy login page. And here I can log into the web console and manage this. So with that said, why, why don't we see something a little bit more interesting? So I know this is like taking up the entire screen here. So I'm gonna run this with a interesting option here, just to show a little bit, of few, a few of the things that I talked about earlier. So with debug. So one of the things I said, it's running through SSH. I can tell you where I'm connecting to. I can tell you the command I'm executing. I can tell you the output it's coming out of it. I can say the steps I've executed in sequential, what they look like, and hopefully, like I promised, uh, I will tell you I am going to close the connection. So uh, just as a hint, if you guys ever took this module and you used it and you didn't see that last line, file a bug with me. So well, I, I do care about closing out all the connections. So those are the things I said the transfer will do for you. And again, feel free to play with it. So now that we've seen that I hate clicking, and uh, here are the modules. So for all of you who use this, feel free to uh, grab it, uh, use it, and apply it in your environment. So um, I want to talk a little bit of some of the things that had challenges and some of the things that I learned in terms of trying to automate this. So uh, we'll go through these three main areas. Uh, first of all is working with APIs. So I always dealt with types and providers dealing with OS commands. I'm always running like yum install or something that I want to automate. Uh, when I work on the vSphere projects first time, uh, on the VCHS projects, it's first time I'm dealing with APIs. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about what are the challenges trying to use a type and provider against APIs. And I think that's gonna be the interesting thing. Uh, one thing I feel about hardware, software, et cetera, I feel like if it doesn't have an API, that's something that's gonna be dying. Because a lot of network vendors today are trying really hard to give APIs. And I feel like that's one of the things. So in the, the VCA uh, NS stack, we have APIs to deal with the firewall rules. So those of you who are clicking through it today, please note that there is a better way. And I feel like we should uh, push and test out the APIs. Because the APIs, if they're not used, they don't get updated. They don't get. So, so the fact that vSphere API has all these, uh, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Ruby, Java, et cetera, interfaces to it means very well tested, and I found that to be very pleasant. And when I started using things that are less used, I feel like I'm, gonna, I'm on the bleeding edge. So I do encourage people to try to start using APIs and treat all their devices like it's an API. And the second thing is I'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the fun stuff we had between the 2.7 and Puppet 3 upgrade, and a few of the Puppet what's. So if you actually start enjoy getting into the internals of Puppet, you're gonna see some of the Puppet what's. Uh, some, of the, some of the perplexing things that cost me hours of time, maybe it'll save you a little bit of time as you deal with it. So uh, the first thing here is uh, functionalities are now, not always in APIs. And I have a disclaimer here. I don't know if all of you know Will Lamb. I will say, like, even if you're Will Lamb, functionalities are not always in APIs. So uh, if you haven't visited his website, it's virtually Gitto, and uh, he published a lot of fantastic stuff. In the beginning, I was like, how do you do this? And his website always has it. And I always thought, like, I can just ask him, because if I don't know the API, Will does. But in the end, there's some stuff that we can't deal with in APIs, and I'll show you some of the problems that we sort out with. You guys put a name wrong, Lamb W. Ooh, ouch. <laughs> OK, so uh, Lamb W. Don't tweet at the wrong guy and scream at him. Uh, the second is uh, dealing with API versions. So they're changing versions and APIs, and we had some pains in terms of dealing with it. 
And the last one is metaprogramming. Any of you heard of metaprogramming? Anyone deal with Ruby metaprogramming? So, so we, do, we do some metaprogramming. I know it's kind of like uh, a little bit esoteric here, but I'll talk to you about the pros and cons in terms of metaprogramming and dealing with APIs. So first of all, outliers. I came to the conclusion that I'll accept that I have to deal with workarounds. So one of the things that we do, and I might get this wrong, is uh, on ESS config, we want to change the management host IP address. It's something you can do in the API. You click it, and it's done. And for the longest time, there's just no vSphere API that allows me to do it. So I had to get, go up, resign, and say, I have to call something through SSH, even though I have vSphere. I'm going to accept a workaround. But in general, I'll adhere to vSphere API. I'll do things in vSphere API, but I have to hack it. Uh, there are command line tools. I'm going to accept this. I'll let them know there's an issue, but I'm going to hack around it. The other problems that we have is there's still truly some stuff that we can't automate. So I also resign to the fact that in our infrastructure, we'll file a service now ticket, but we'll automate the process of filing a service ticket. Because <laughs> again, did I, I'm going to repeat, I'm not a clicker. Click fail. I'm going to sell a t-shirt called click fail, and I think it's going to be very successful. So service now request, I'll pass in a subject and says, please, please click yes. I will tell someone to click yes, but I can't, like this automated system will tell you where to go, what to click. I can't deal with it today, but trust me if I can fix it. I hate that, and I'm the first guy who's going to help the ops guy to get rid of this ticket, because I hate clicking probably as much as they will when they realize how much clicking I'm going to send their way, because I can't automate. So the next thing is uh, testing with API versions. So we use Puppet Apply. The reason we use Puppet Apply is environments don't quite deal with lib versions. So if you use environments and you use Puppet today, Puppet Manifest is fantastic. You make a manifest change, I have a different uh, environment, I apply it, I run it, done. I, and then I can merge this in Git. It's, it works beautifully, but unfortunately, I'm dealing with all the stuff on, that requires types and providers, and it requires Ruby lib. So I have to deal with things in libdir, and one of the things that really bothered me for a while was plug-in sync. Plug-in sync is fantastic, but it always syncs the version from the server. And when I sync the version of the, the APIs from the server, I'm not testing the local things I have. So I have to set libdir to dev null. Uh, Bundler is fantastic. Uh, when I was testing the 3.2 upgrade, the guy's like, I'm running blah, blah version of offering system with this version of Puppet, and everyone's like, well, that's going to take you a while to duplicate. Not really. I'm just going to change the version of Puppet I have. Puppet updates to 3.2, 3.3, 3.2.4. I can keep up with it. I just do bundle update. It works reasonably well. I can test it. It's not how we deploy Puppet in production, but for testing, this works fantastically. And uh, we also like patch our BV mommy a little bit. And so if you notice that we have a little custom Tilda version, we have some issues with 187 with our BV mommy. So we provide a custom patch. It is in our Puppet module. It, it is what needs to get installed. So that's the reason why there's this source file repo above because I have to copy the gem locally. I can't install the uh, version from Ruby gems, uh, but it should be less of an issue because now uh, Puppet three is on Ruby 19. Three, and you really shouldn't need our custom patch version. That was for P27. So um, the next thing I'm going to just dive in briefly is about metaprogramming. So when we started dealing with vSphere APIs, uh, anyone know how big the document is? I don't. I think it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. So uh, when we started looking at the API, we finally realized we can't be manually copying the documents API to our type and then going through figuring out how to apply it over and over again. That's what we did in the beginning, because we didn't know what, what things would look like. So the first couple resources we wrote, we wrote it by looking at the API, writing a type that matches the API, and then writing a provider and doing the work. Later on, we realized, well, it's, we can introspect it. We can look at what uh, methods are available. We can look at where, what are you looking for in terms of value. And if we have those things, we can auto-generate the type. And we're like, fantastic. So we use metaprogramming to look at our BV mommy and says, well, what do you want for a network? OK, these are the value for a network. So these are the value for a network inside a puppet type. That solved all the API copying problem. We're not looking at documentation anymore. We're simply parsing the API and figuring out what a type should look like. Uh, unfortunately, once we got over the euphoric part, once we copy all this thing, we don't have to copy paste anymore. We don't have to do those things anymore. We found out metaprogramming. There's a reason why most people don't jump in at first. It's really kind of hard to debug. Uh, and also the inside the API, uh, things are in the API that they expect, 
they're not always idempotent. One of the simple example is I think the network switches, they want you to pass in there, are you doing a create or modify? So when we simply introspect it, we know you got to pass in a parameter called create or modify. But as a puppet guy, when you apply something on a switch, the first time it's create, the second time it's modify. You don't really want to change that value. You want the API to be smart enough to deal with it. Unfortunately, we didn't quite solve that. So there, there's some problems with our metaprogramming. So the, the API is not designed to be idempotent, so that's one of the challenges we have. So if you use the networking portion, you may realize some things you can apply it the first time, but the second time when you apply it, it's because some of the, the inconsistencies between the API. So we wish to we have some time to get this solved and iron out, but there's some inconsistencies here. So um, jumping to the next thing, which is the Puppet 3 upgrade, uh, a couple of the challenges that we had is related to scope. So for those of you who do uh, Puppet Manifest, you're going to be familiar with the at variable that changes from uh, dynamic scope to lexico scope. So the variables inside your template has to be changed to an at sign instead of just referencing the variable name. For those of you who do type in providers, uh, you've lost the home environment variable. It's, uh, it's a very mystifying thing until you finally get to the bottom of it. I don't know, apparently a lot, of, uh, a lot of commands depend on knowing where your home is. So RabbitMQ needs to know where your home is. If you run brew on Mac, brew needs to know where your home directory is. So you need to restore the home directory on there. And also the upgrade of 193. So there's, there's a couple of issues related to upgrade on 193. So scope, this is fully qualified VARs. Uh, just to give an example. Um, yeah, this is pretty common, so I'm not going to go into a lot of details. Basically, you just pass in colon colon instead of the bar itself. Uh, where's my home? This is also pretty straightforward. So today, if you specify a command such as homebrew as user local bin brew, uh, on Puppet 3, you have to tell it to, by the way, I really want you to preserve the environment home. So this is one of the things that kind of bit us as we upgraded our, our resources we needed to get home, the environment home restored. And then there's some puppet what. So if you look at that picture, that is actually the Portland thing. If you do enjoy going to Portland, there's a few. It's Darth Vader, and I don't think you can see it, but he's in riding a unicycle, blowing a bagpipe. And it's, it's, a, it's, and it's a definition of what is, it looks so crazy, you can't explain it. So there's a few of these we ran into puppet that was like a what took more than a day to figure out what the heck is going on. First of all, Boolean, surprisingly, you would think Boolean simple. One, zero, true, false. Unfortunately, Puppet's way of handling Boolean, you might run into some surprises. Adrian wrote uh, a module called Adrian Boolean just to help solve some of the inconsistencies. Uh, if you look at VM or lib property, we had to do some stuff. I call it symbol because we can't use Booleans. Booleans don't translate. We had to use a symbol true, symbol false to deal with Booleans. And that's just one of those, I can't explain it. It's, there's some uh, internal bug in Puppet, or maybe it's an internal design of Puppet in terms of true-false, but if you're dealing with hashes, you have to deal with some symbols. Uh, what the undef? Uh, so what's the behavior of undef? Uh, undef, on certain versions of Puppet, if you pass an undef, it means I'm not specifying this value. If you have a value, use that. In some versions of Puppet, it means I'm passing in undef, so if you have a default value, I'm changing it to undef and unsetting it. So there's, there's a slight inconsistency, but I think they went back to the same behavior in 2.7, so I think there's, there's a particular version I can't remember, so that mystified me a little bit. And the last thing is uh, someone asked earlier, says, are you using ENCs? We are using ENCs, and one of the strange things is, puppet integers, is it a string? This is, this is a trivia question. I know it's getting into internal puppet. So when you write a puppet manifest and you pass in an integer, is it really an integer or is it a string? It's a number at all. So those who say number, raise your hand. You got one guy, two guy. Anyone else? Are those who say string, raise your hand. OK, so string is correct. And I have the Puppet Labs professional service and engineer, so I know I didn't get this wrong. So it is a string. So the problem that we ran into is our ENC actually passes the integer value in, and the integer map value don't match the string value. And because they don't match the string value, Puppet says, I got to make some changes. So Puppet internally in your manifest does this fantastic thing that's kind of like, I don't know, duct typing maybe. It duct types everything to string, and everything simply treated as string. But if you have an ENC and you have integer values, make sure you munge your ENC's integer values and change it to us. If you don't do that, you'll see some surprising things. So I don't know if everyone here writes their own custom ENC's. We did, we had to import a lot of data, but this is another puppet what. So again, 
like I said, I like pushing towards the edge of things a little bit. So where we are today, we're deploying VPCs. We're deploying VPCs to broad. We deploy multiple of these. Multiple vClouds have been stood up. Uh, our deployment time, I don't have the exact numbers of how long it took to manually do them. I know based on that doc and how long I took it, and with all my mistakes, it was astronomical. I know the guys with experience probably a little bit faster than me. But once we got it into Puppet, I think we estimated somewhere around 95% reduction in time. So that's one of the side benefits. Besides clicking less, it happened a lot quicker. When someone said, I want one of these, they got one within a much more reasonable time. Uh, configuration management equals version. So no one's coming to me and saying, your doc is wrong. They're coming to me and saying, your puppet manifest is wrong. I go like, I'm happy. I can deal with puppet manifest is wrong because I fix it. It means the next deploy gets fixed. It's not the same as, oh, my documentation is wrong. I fixed my documentation. Let me send a memo out. Let me let everyone know. So I'm much happier with that. And a couple other metrics, we're using 47 modules. Half of them come from Puppet Labs and other open source people. The other half is probably internal. We're doing 70 custom resources, so all the types and provider we wrote, uh, there's about 70 of them. And we're managing about 1,400 resources to get one of these VCD up. And I'm pretty happy, like I said, a lot less clicking for me. So the challenges. Uh, if any of this sounds exciting to you, we're definitely looking for people. We want to solve the problem of software-defined data center, and uh, uh, I won't get into the details about how we do the data to Puppet, because that's going to be a separate talk altogether, but we want to solve the problem of data-driven uh, configuration management. If you saw my Puppet manifest earlier, most of it don't have like IP addresses, don't have values, et cetera. We want to have data drive modules, so those are some problems we want to solve. And also, we're getting jumping into software-defined networking. We're deploying VCNS. Uh, NICERA is coming online. And like I said, a lot of people don't think of network devices yet as things you can manage like Puppet. But I want to say, no, no, totally, you can. There's an API. You can manage your network device just like you manage your offering system today. And we want to scale up. So I said I had a 95% reduction in time to deploy this. That doesn't mean it's as fast as it's going to get. We, can it be 10x faster, 100x faster, 1,000x faster? I don't know. We're looking for getting it faster and now, because every customer wants it faster. Because if we get a 95% reduced, we go like, I still want it faster. So, uh, and a quick shout out. I want to thank Nick. Uh, I'm not going to shout out every name. This is all the people have uh, contributed to the modules. It includes a few folks from Puppet Labs, such as Brandon and Zach. Uh, so I do want to thank all the people who have worked towards the modules. And if you will want to be one of them, just look us up on the, our GitHub and Take a fork of it and come see me. So um, if I did okay, I think I have a few minutes for Q&A. Anyone have any questions? Feel free. Um, Mike, please. What's the URLs back up? The URLs back up, sure. Uh, go ahead. I'm going right. to look for that slide. So My, you went I, I'm PowerPoint fail. <laughs> uh, this, is, this is not a software which I'm an expert in. So when we saw this a couple of months ago, we got in, inspired and started to write, uh, try and write an auto deploy rule set mm -hmm. provider, and quickly ran into the API problem that you mentioned earlier, which is that we couldn't find an auto deploy API that wasn't just PowerShell. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you know anything about that, or if there's anyone here that might be able to. I don't know the auto deploy stuff very well. Mm -hmm. I, I think can the VMware guys raise their hands? Or are they going to be hiding? All right, they're going to be in hiding, so. So, so it's, it's feasible to do it, um, parsing offline. Okay. But yeah, it's completely feasible. In fact, um, there's a gentleman who's ever worked at a place up called Allen Mill, who works at VMware, and um, she trained him on the API features. He's really just the expert on that API. Okay. And um, if, if, you just, if you pay him, um, we can save you a little man and just get started getting started online. Cool. All right. Yeah, yeah so, so there, there's Nick. And he, since he already responded, uh, API questions, send them to Nick. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh, come on, Nick. OK, well, thanks again for all your time. Uh, feel free to check out the GitHub stuff. Uh, come up to me if you have any other follow-up questions. Uh, and uh, if anyone wants a silly discount to the Puppet Type and Provider book, I have a few discount code, uh, and I can hand you a few of them if you're interested in getting a book and saying, how do I get started with this? So thanks again for everyone's time.